Easter is that time when people look ahead to the summer might plan a holiday, what do you think we should do, all that. And normally when uh, we talk about travel on this show, we're recommending places to go. But today we're kind of turning it around a little bit and looking at places to avoid. Places that don't necessarily live up to the hype, that might be a bit underwhelming and we're offering alternatives uh, for where you might go. I'm joined by Owen Corrie, editor of Travel Extra and Lisa Regan who runs her own PR company in Galway and is an intrepid traveller. Owen Stark, you're both very welcome indeed. Travel is kind of personal, something I might love to do, you might absolutely hate to do. This is uh, quite interesting. People actually don't decide for it to go on holidays, Marion. Uh, somebody decides for them. You could actually decide you want to go up the mountains in um, Bolivia or something, but by the time you've worked out the air access and the price, you say, this is not feasible. Where are we going? We're going back to Malaga like everybody else. Yes. <laughs> and for years, it was travel companies, the big travel the, uh, tour operators and the travel agents. The distinction between the two is quite blurred nowadays who decided it because they were the ones who put the charters. You flew out on Saturday, came Come home on Saturday, Saturday, two by two, bucket and spade. It was very, very simple. Um, then and very th- enjoyable. And very enjoyable and very expensive, actually, by today's standards. Yeah. The price uh, for a holiday in the early 80s was much the same as it is now for your family of four. And it, obviously the earning power is quite different. The uh, big airlines, notably Ryanair, led by Ryanair, but also Aer Lingus, then started chasing the tour operators into the destinations they would tend to go, which would be the Balearics, Malaga, the Canaries. And they uh, more or less started giving people alter- other alternatives, which meant you could now fly out on a Tuesday or Thursday. Yeah. But it's quite interesting that the decision is still made by access. And uh, key to what you're talking about this morning is that a lot of um, the places that are decided by the industry as a whole yeah. are the places people want to go have become a little bit crowded or a little bit expensive. Yeah. And uh, it can be somewhere that's very, very beautiful uh, on a wonderful day in this time of the year, in March or April. Uh, it can Hell when, on wheels. When, you, you know, you've, if you can have four cruise ships pulling into Dubrovnik or um, Venice with 4,000 passengers each on them, each of them trying to see the same attraction at the same time. And it can be uh, hot, gr- uh, everyone gets grumpy. And um, then you sit down and go for your cup of coffee and you find you're paying five times the going rate because uh, the but, industry industry works in the way that they will charge what they can get yeah. and people come home very grumpy from what should have been a dream holiday if you were to look at the list that the listicles that yeah. turn up in magazines now telling you where you should be going Right, um, Lisa you, you, you kind of share the view uh, and you're just back from Copenhagen yeah. and you're dismissing the Little Mermaid yeah, I was in Copenhagen. Uh, I was in Sweden first and then I went on in Malmo and then I came across to Copenhagen. And uh, Copenhagen is such a, an incredible city and it's just so known for its food. And, and Malmo? Malmo, there's just no soul to it. After you got off the train and you went over the bridge and you were so excited by that, it was just flat. It just, everything just seemed to be closed all the time and it was, it was just nothing happening there. The conference of that was great. So that was one positive I took from it. What was the conference? <laughs> it's uh, the Power Bear Forum. So it's an international culinary conference for the, I suppose, the promotion of women working in the culinary arts to All have right. a level playing field for that. So it was very interesting, very right. on top of it. A lot about vertical growing and things like that. So I really What's enjoyed it. What's vertical growing? So it's these farms that are popping up. Um, there's one in Brooklyn now. There's a couple in London. You know, the way there's obviously no space anywhere to do anything in cities. So vertical growing of all our vegetables and plants and everything in like user spaces on rooftops and things like that. Yeah. And I saw one on a wall yeah. at, at one stage in, in Los Angeles and it was all herbs and stuff. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. And it's beautiful it. to look at and yeah. so it's like edible. It's trying to make the, the the topic of the conference was edible cities. So it's trying to make our urban spaces basically more sustainable. So it's, 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 phenomenal. it's largely eyewash though, Lisa, because the amount of herbs you can grow in this uh, doesn't sustain the, the quantity of what they're serving. I think a lot of it is uh, we have this little space on the rooftop and you everyone imagines all the food is coming from there and uh, what you come across increasingly is they have their little swarm of, of bees on the roof as well and obviously all the honey that's served in the hotel is supposed to come from uh, the same swarm of bees but I, I don't believe it for a second. They're I impor- <laughs> they're oh, imp- they're oh, I'm sorry. Now. They're topping it up. They're the topping it up. Oh, it's <laughs> no, I think it's a definite step in the right direction and if you look at the farm that's even in Brooklyn 
and people have to start taking accountability for things like this. There's like restaurants in Ireland here. It's easier for us. We've we've more green and more landmass. Like there's a restaurant in Galway and Dila. They have their own farm. They're growing their own veggies now. Yeah, and they're supplying their own restaurants. And I think it's really positive. Now <coughs> back to Copenhagen though, and the Little Mermaid. <laughs> yeah, um, I the Little Mermaid made, played a very important part in my life. Once. Oh, and, er, but and somebody Mar- said to me, so when you're looking at the Little Mermaid, four doors up. Yeah. In that direction is one of the best seafood restaurants in the world. And with that mere bit of direction, I had heaven. See, I love that. That that was one part. But we <laughs> went on to Copenhagen. There was so much to see and do there, but we only had one day. Um, so we went on a bike tour around Copenhagen with a man called Mike. And it was the best decision we ever made. And that was our last stop. Uh, the Little Mermaid was See, there. See, if you were going to New York yeah. for the first time or you were going to Paris for the first time, are you, you're good doing something that you really look forward to and anticipate as being a terrific holiday. And as Owen says, you're going to pay for it. Yeah. Um, I wonder sometimes if, you know, if you go to Paris, you have to do the Eiffel Tower. If you go to New York, you have to do the Empire State. Should one switch one's head around a bit? I think so. There are about three attractions in every city and you end up queuing horribly and, you know, if trying to get into them. My very strong advice is if you're going to go for a first time, do it off the peak season and uh, avail of whatever you can in terms of access and in terms of prices, because prices can change. Prices can be uh, higher in summertime or higher at a certain time of the day. Or higher in in school holidays. They they travel during school holidays, Marion. It's not a joke. Uh, Anybody trying to bring children away, it's it's quite uh, quite difficult. But, um, every every, you know, when you mention New York, um, the Empire State Building is quite expensive to climb and uh, when you get up there you see New York from the Empire State whereas if you go to the Rockefeller Centre at the top of the rock uh, it's less pricey it, if listeners will know the famous picture of the, all the workers on the girder sitting or looking yeah, down yes, on the city that was taken during the construction of the Rockefeller Centre yeah. so you actually see the Manhattan skyline with the Empire State Building as part of it it's a much better view there's loads of things uh, you can you take your you pay your, your overpriced uh, trip around the Statue of Liberty. You can actually go on board the, st- you know, the island and d- visit the um, Ellis Island Museum and all of that. But if you get the free ferry to Staten Island, exactly. you get the same view over and back, yeah. over and back, yeah. and it's beautiful and it doesn't cost anything, which is uh, quite a, a extraordinary yeah, in, New York. in New York City. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! It's well, funnily enough, when you mention Ellis Island, I really would recommend people go to Ellis Island. It's just a personal thing. Yeah, you, you know, it, it taps into your imagination about our own. history history and all that. No, it does. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, In that thing that if you're going, if you're going to Sydney, if you're Mm -hmm. going to New York, if you're going to, now people will be going to visit their emigrant children, uh, don't automatically think of the obvious. No, because sometimes I think with travel, isn't that the one time that we can fall a little bit out of our routine? And I think sometimes it's a tick the box exercise travel. I have to go and do this. And I, I, we've that done now. And it's it's like, all about taking boxes. Yeah, so sometimes I'm like, no, should you not like go somewhere? And everyone's free to do whatever they want anywhere. And I understand that. But for me, it was like, it, it, take the box travel for me is just not it. I'm like, if I have no interest in something, even just to take case in point, the Eiffel Tower, I'm not going there. I want to experience something else. I want to experience Parisian life. I want to just go and figure out the city for myself, not go and look at this thing. And people sometimes just want to go for the old Instagram photo then as well, you know. Well, the other <laughs> thing is in the Louvre. Mm-hmm. You will find it's it's like Crow Park. <coughs> excuse me, in front of the Mona Lisa. You've stayed. And there's amazing art all around, with nobody looking at it. No, because they're not told. Including the including Francis, who brought the Mona Lisa to uh, the Louvre, uh, no, to Paris in the first place. He's a laughing portrait, laughing at all the people queuing up to see the Louvre. And as you say, amazing art around. If you were to go back a uh, hundred years, the Louvre wouldn't even be rated as one of the mo- big attraction, yeah. most attractive paintings. Uh, it just came into fashion, right. and now uh, lots of people just go to what see one painting on board. Uh, it's as uh, Lisa says, tick the box, tick yeah. the boxes. Yeah, and how cute. tourism yeah. has come. To to work, yeah, and uh, you see it on safari. I mean, the big five. You have to see the big five. They they don't get back on that plane from Nairobi or uh, wherever um, Dar es Salaam happy unless they've seen the five big. particular animals, which That's are right. far more interesting animals all around them. The um, the other thing is we were talking about.
about food um, earlier on, and Kevin Dundon was in, and Asian seems to be creeping into everything, nearly into bacon and cabbage. <laughs> um, and that really is because of the travel to um, Thailand. A bit of that, but, you know, what passes for Asian food in main markets uh, and what you actually found in Asia sometimes bear no resemblance to each other. Uh, the most spectacular example being the word curry. I think you mentioned and it. In yes, this. yeah. Uh, it's a, it is a South Indian dish, but it's come to be the generic name for every spice that uh, you can find in India. It's very interesting to go into... Uh, Asian countries and the, a sad uh, thing creeping in where they've begun to cook their own food for Western tastes yeah. instead of Indeed. doing what they really got out of really strong uh, recommendation uh, to go into countries that aren't as washed over by Western tourism. Lao instead of Thailand, mm-hmm. Cambodia instead of Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Lots of amazing street food and things like that that you can come across. But, you, but if aren't. you ate street food... Truly, would you not have to have the equivalent of a chemist shop in your in your luggage for what might happen to you? It's um, less a problem than it has been, but your your the danger of it is is omnipresent, and it's just basically your stomach's going to meet an amoebic system with which it's not familiar. Yeah. there aren't really any shortcuts for that. Right. Yeah, I think that with Asian food too. Um, I absolutely love Asian countries, but I appreciate them for their individuality, and I think what's happened here is that. It's a fusion of Asian that's coming across. So people actually don't understand that there's different food cultures cultures in every Asian country. And that's, I think, a, a really sad thing, really, about the food and everything. Because I love it, but I love it for different reasons. Like, I love Thai food, but I love Malaysian. But they're not the same. But people think that the fusion of they're them together is, yeah. So it's, in together. Yeah, they're all blended in together for people. So... Have you got such a jaded palate now that there is nowhere in the world that can excite you, Eamon Carey? Eamon Carey, even probably I call you by a proper (laughs) name. Eamon Carey. But the thing is... um, I like tr- I try things. I've eaten almost everything that imaginable. I ate a mouse uh, once in, oh. in Malawi, and um, I recently did you know it at the time? I did, and they all they came out to oh, mock. It, uh, it was served on a skewer with a head, tail at one end and a head at the oh, other. Oh my god! And it did. I did gag a bit, only from you know memories. I'm sure yeah. my cat at Linger at home would have loved it. But <laughs> the um, recently I did um, it's an alternative South African um, t- tour where we went into Soweto and we ate um, the cheap cuts, the cheek of beef and the, the pan, the, you know, the, the ground up maize. Uh, it was served up to us as what the miners were eating. It was basically yeah. the cheapest and most amazing food. We were brought into a, uh, an attraction in Soweto to eat this as our meal. And it was the most magnificent uh, tasting, but it was not going to be a fine dining experience or anything. But it's interesting for the reason that we go to these places in the first place. And one of the problems with international travel is the homogenisation of almost everything, the homogenisation yeah. of the, the streets that we walk down, the same brands on the side and the invasion of Western style restaurants Completely to the extent agree. that people who are in developing countries have it in their head, particularly in their hospitality industry, particularly where a lot of the managers are coming from these Western yeah. countries in the yeah. first place, mm-hmm. that this is all that Western tourists will do. And Western tourists will behave almost like that. There are hotel chains that will not... Uh, put the the hotel the plug in the hotel room in a different place. They will want it the homogenized yeah. right through the world. It's not good for that experiential, it's to use that horrible buzzword yeah. uh, aspect of tourism. But I don't think mass markets uh, react to going out and seeking the new experience in eating right. and shopping, anything like that. What yeah. I did in Soweto will be done by a fraction of the people who will go down to Cape Town and do the wine trail and the uh, yeah. garden trail and eat the same food as they would be eating at right. home. And and you go along with that? Oh, absolutely, Marion. I think there's nothing sadder than you know, when you see all these coffee chains and drink outlets and everything popping up in every city and town that you go into. What's the point in travel then? It's like you could be in any city in the world, you know. I live in Galway and I like I love the fact that there's so many independent retailers there that are owned by the people that run the business and they're working in the business to right. me that's what makes a place special you know you're yeah. meeting people that but are actually behind the business but then you see some people like to go on their holidays and they like to shop and they're entitled to if they yeah, want to I know I don't know why it, it makes me kind it, of it actually has helped the tourist industry that they tend to congregate in the same sort of places you know <laughs> there are the uh, the Benny Dorms of the world which make uh, it possible to visit right, yeah. uh, the rest of yeah. Spain without being being flushed over. There are places like um, Dubai, Cancun, 
uh, created completely for yeah, the tourist traffic. industry yeah. uh, with virtually nothing to offer but it leaves the more beautiful parts like um, Oman uh, and yeah. uh, uh, Chiapas in the yeah. south of Mexico free for yeah. real tourism. Right. <laughs> OK, listen, thank you both uh, very much indeed. That was Lisa Regan and Owen Corrie and happy travel. By the way, lyrics competition. Winner is Connor Deneen in Skerries in County Dublin. Well done, Connor. Enjoy the uh, whole experience. And it was Banana Republic, Rat Trap and I Don't Like Mondays. Marion, I just want to say I had a genuine passport emergency last week. Had the good fortune to meet the nicest people in the world at the passport office in Dublin. They rescued my vacation plans. Please give them a mention. They're swamped with work and managed to be really uh, customer service orientated. Mm -hmm. That's nice. That's very nice story to hear. That's all we've time for for today. Today's programme was produced by Rachel Graham, researchers Katrina McFadden and Michelle Brown, broadcasting coordinator Jarlath Holland, series producer is Margaret Carley. Back with you tomorrow, usual time until then, a very good day to you.